Emily Calandrelli. Welcome to the Motherly Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I always like to start by asking my guests about their journey before and after motherhood. So I'm curious, you know, if you had an idea of what motherhood would be like for you and how that was similar or different to what it actually was like in reality. Yeah, I mean, I think that when I was expecting motherhood to be, I was sort of imagining all of the good parts (laughs) and I failed to do any research on some of the harder parts of it, like Mm -hmm. especially early on, um, which was just all of the recovery from labor um, because my recovery in particular was really tough. Um, I'm still recovering from my first child that I had two and a half years ago. (laughs) And I think mentally preparing for that change was not something Mm. I was um, totally prepared for. I also wasn't prepared for just like the, the, like I want to say love, love is the word that I'm thinking of, but like it feels so much more painful than that, that Mm. you feel. Um, especially in the early months, I would just like stare at my daughter in her crib and just be heartbroken that Mm. she would never be that small or little again. And I kept telling myself it was the growing pains of my heart growing to make room for this new human. But it was just like very, very difficult in the beginning Mm. to wrap my mind around the fact that this human that I created was just going to constantly grow and get older and older and older. Mm. There's a lot there. Um, I guess one of the questions I have is you you are a scientist, and although you largely focus on outer space and, and the worlds beyond and opening our horizons, you know, pregnancy and postpartum and motherhood is a very, it's a scientific process that happens to us. Um, I wonder how you looked at the science of pregnancy and postpartum and even the ongoing like unfolding of your child um, from the point of view of, you know, a scientist who loves to wonder? Yeah. For me, I'm very data driven. Um, And so before my first child, I gathered all of the different parenting books, all of the different um, like pregnancy books and early childhood books. And I found that there were not that many (laughs) that were data driven. Mm. There are a lot there that are based on anecdotes that are based Mm -hmm. on just like personal experiences. And for me, those didn't resonate as much. Um, Mm -hmm. I kind of took those with a grain of salt and it took me a while to find um, books that really spoke to me because they would reference uh, like peer reviewed research that was done uh, over the course of many years on many different subjects. And um, that was the kind of stuff that I was really drawn to. But Mm. for me, like sorting through all of the different parenting resources was hard because Mm. there's not a ton of information out there that is based on um, solid data. Mm. Was there a part of pregnancy or postpartum that was, I want to say magical, but I, but in the (laughs) context of science, it's not the right word, but something that you could really marvel at. I mean, I, the labor process for me was so cool like I, I absolutely like I loved maybe is not the right term, but I was induced um, about a week late because my daughter was getting bigger and bigger and I was not prepared physically for that. And uh, so I was induced and there was a lot of different stages of the induction that I just, I, it was fat. It was so novel to me, like, uh, feeling how all of these different drugs affected my body. I thought was really interesting. The Foley balloon, how that worked. I mean, I, I thought I, I was, uh, I had fentanyl, I had the epidural. And so I had the luxury of being able to like, kind of process what was happening at the time, rather than focusing on the pain. I could actually think about all of these different things that were happening to my body and think about the fact that like within the next 24 hours I was going to become a mom and I was going to have a daughter and how grown up that felt and I actually on my Instagram I I I didn't like live stream the labor but I did update my followers with each new thing that was happening 
and telling them in real time how it felt and what I was experiencing. And for me, that was really therapeutic and just a really fun and unique way to experience this thing that was kind of happening to me. You're not many people get to uh, document in real time <laughs> to lots of followers, their birth process. So that's really cool. And I can see that your, your love of data and recording and all of that came into play <laughs> for motherhood. Um, let's talk a little bit about you and your childhood. Um, you have a book series, the Ada Lace book series for kids, which features a little girl, very interested in science growing up in West Virginia. Um, so tell us about that little girl and how that relates to your actual childhood that you did also grow up in, in West Virginia yep. and loving science and technology. Yeah. So Ada is kind of the girl that I wish that I was when I was a kid. Ada is this third grader who loves science and technology, and she goes on these adventures to solve mysteries with tech and gadgets that she usually builds herself. And she is the type of kid who is not afraid to fail. She's not afraid to ask for help. She's not afraid to try something, even if it might be hard, even if she might not be good at it at first. And mm -hmm. I kind of infused all of the insecurities that I had as a child into this girl who was not afraid of those same things. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of times girls growing up today are conditioned to not want to try hard things because we are afraid to fail. And if we fail, what does that say about us? Does that mean that we're not smart, that we're not capable, that we're not brave, whatever um, that could mean. And so I wanted to create a character that was not afraid of any of those things. Um, and so, yeah, she's someone that I, I wish that I had a book like this when I was mm. a kid for sure. You mentioned that that characteristic of to put a word to it, like perfectionism, that we groom yes. our daughters to be perfect, um, really resonated for your own story. Like, tell me about that. What did perfectionism look like for you? Maybe what does it still look like for you? And, and how does that contrast with like the scientific process and iteration and just an ongoing mm. discovery? Yeah, I, I feel like it's at odds with the scientific process because there is no such thing as perfectionism in science. Science is all about trial and error, and the error part of science is so necessary to be able to get closer mm. to the truth um, and to get closer to building this knowledge of the universe around us. And so perfectionism for me, it manifested itself in just long hours of homework and being very anxious a mm. lot of the time growing up because the thing is I wasn't a smart kid growing up. I didn't consider myself mean? like I, I literally, there was a, I think a lot of schools have this. There's a test that you can take some sort of aptitude test where if you pass, then you get into the like smart kids classroom where they do, I don't know, extra mm -hmm. readings and smart people things. And I took that test when I was in maybe fifth grade or so and did not pass. And so I was not, I never considered myself one of the smart kids. I certainly tried very hard, <laughs> um, but that just wasn't in the cards for me. And so I was somebody who always worked harder than anybody else mm. in the class and spent many, many hours on homework and worked to make myself, quote, one of the smart kids, because what does that even mean? Mm. Um, and so when I got older, when I was a high school senior, and I was going to des decide what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, I knew that I wanted to have a good paying job. Um, my dad grew up in poverty in West Virginia and, and worked his way up to bring our family to middle class. And I had mm -hmm. that legacy in the back of my mind when I was figuring out what I wanted to do with my life. And so mm -hmm. when I was a high school senior, I literally Googled all of the majors one could major in and I looked at their starting salaries and engineers made some of the top starting salaries. And that is how I decided to go into engineering. I was not a kid that thought, I'm gonna be good at this. I'm gonna love this. I have a natural uh, like, like ability to be able to do this. I didn't know any scientists or engineers. I'm the first person in my family to pursue a degree in STEM. Um, and so that is ultimately how I got into this field, kind of reluctantly, 
But then once I got there, there were so many things that made me very excited (laughs) about this world that I am now obsessed with. Well, I read that once you got to college and were studying engineering that it actually turned out you're really, really good at it. Um, And then (laughs) you got your master's at MIT. So clearly that program in fifth grade was not able to capture the full trajectory of your intellectual life, which is just a good note for all of us who either have been there ourselves or are raising our children, navigating through all of that. Um, but you also have such an interesting and unique career, um, marrying it's kind of the left brain with the right brain, the science, as well as the creativity. Is this work that you do today as a science communicator and educator? Is this what you thought you would wind up doing when you were picking that major <laughs> in engineering? Uh, No, this is not the career that I expected to have. Um, This is, I don't even think science communication was really a standard career where you talk about science online or on TV and truly make money from it um, until five or 10 years ago, because traditionally, with the great exception of Bill Nye, um, most science shows were hosted by people who had acting backgrounds um, and just presented science information on television or introduce people to scientific people on television. So it was very rare for a science show to have somebody with a science background hosting the show. Mm. Um, And when I was uh, graduating from MIT, I got a call from a production company that asked me if I wanted to be the host of a new space TV show. And um, they found me. Everyone always asks, like, how did they find you? That seems totally random if you didn't have any TV experience, Mm -hmm. which I didn't. Um, They found me just because I had done a lot of outreach. And I talked a lot about the benefits of NASA and space and science. I've been doing that kind of stuff for a long time, but mostly in my own community. But there were these videos of me talking about space and science. So they found me through so cool. those types of things and I said yes and it's been quite the roller coaster ever yeah. since. Well many of our listeners and certainly many mothers came to know you through your Netflix show mm-hmm. called Emily's Wonder Lab. Um, I know at Motherly we all noticed in particular that you were super pregnant when you were oh, hosting yeah. this show. Um, what did it mean to you to host the show while visibly pregnant. I think you were nine months pregnant at the time. Yes. I'm, you know, I read in another interview that, um, you didn't really address it on the show, which I find super interesting. Um, so why didn't you address it? And, you know, what did that mean to you as a human and also, you know, as a scientist and representing women in science? Yeah. I, I mean, I never saw pregnant women doing much of anything, growing up on TV, um, other than focusing on the pregnancy and focusing on the motherhood aspect of it. And so being able to present this pregnant person on television who was doing science and the pregnancy wasn't part of it. They just happened to be pregnant. I just happened to be wildly pregnant (laughs) at the time. Like that is the type of representation that I, I, I'm so proud to be able to have because I think it shows kids that you can want a family and you can want to be a parent Mm -hmm. and have all of those things and also have other passions outside of it. Um, I think especially for little girls, that's the type of representation we need because if we don't see that you can do both, that you can have a family and be a scientist, that's one of the things that leads to this gender gap in STEM. It's one Mm -hmm. of the reasons I'm so proud to work with a company like Olay, who's working to double the number of women in STEM and triple the number of women of color in STEM by the year Mm. 2030, because representation is just such an important aspect of this. We need to see somebody like us in these positions, in these career paths to be able to envision ourselves in them as well. Yeah. And I, I mean, speaking from for myself and what I what it meant to me to have you representing pregnancy in the world I really loved actually the fact that it wasn't something you were talking about on the show Mm -hmm. it was just that you were being who you are and many of us women 
will have children during the course of our lives. It wasn't treated as weird um, or a sideshow. Like, I don't know if you've ever seen <laughs> headlines like Kate Middleton flaunts her baby bump at event. You know, those have always bothered me because they really do treat pregnancy and the the life journey of women as, you know, you're not flaunting your belly you j- literally cannot help how large yeah. your belly gets during pregnancy and so I kind of love that you just said this is who I am and I'm not apologizing for it I'm not really even going to address it because in doing so like I'm bringing representation and destigmatizing pregnancy in a what seems to me to be a really health- healthy way yeah, I th- we thought so too. And also there just wasn't a good way to address it. I mean, it felt like very weird to be like, okay, everybody, children gather round, yes. look at my bump. <laughs> like there was no good way to talk about it that anyways. And so we were just like, why, let's just not address it at all. It doesn't need to be addressed. It's not part of the show. I just, this is the state of life that I'm currently in right now. So let's let it be. Mm. Well, thank you for representing so, (laughs) so many of us who are pregnant at work and making it work. Mm -hmm. Um, You brought up STEM, and I'm really curious about your perspective, both as a STEM educator and someone working in STEM, as well as a parent um, and raising a child. Women and girls only make up 27% of the workforce in STEM fields. As you know, as you mentioned, those are often also some of the highest paying jobs. Um, And it really starts so early being discouraged by science or math or being steered into so-called like nurturing professions. Um, How do you advise parents to begin to talk about STEM as a career, especially if our listeners perhaps didn't choose STEM careers? Maybe they're just like me, you know, didn't see Mm -hmm. themselves in those fields. Yeah, I mean, for me, I since I'm the first person in my family to go into STEM, I think my parents had the same predicament of like, how do we support this child who has a totally different interest than we do? Mm. And I mean, for me, it was just helpful that they loved and supported me and were they would do all of the research in the world to try to understand the stuff that I was passionate about. Um, they would try to introduce me to... Um, mentors and people who were women in the field and just do their best to extend their reach into this this world that they didn't really know. Mm. Um, I think representation is so important. You can find female scientists, um, female engineers on social media that are talking about the work that they do because this is just an entirely new field mm. that is popping up everywhere. There are so many wonderful women in STEM on Instagram and on TikTok and on YouTube who do science or talk about science or they're makers and they create robots and you can just introduce your children to these people and have them watch educational videos on social media, which is something that probably already feels pretty natural to right. them. Um, and that that's one very simple way I mm-hmm. think um, parents can help make all of the world of STEM feel more normal to their kids. There's also the technology side of it, right? And I just, it makes me think about so many, literally millions of women who are reassessing their own careers. And I've seen, you know, many companies in the tech field helping, especially women, learn coding and all kinds of um, upskilling programs that are really exciting. And those are just, to our listeners, those are also possibilities. Even if you never saw yourself as someone in technology or someone in STEM, there are a number of initiatives to make it easier for especially women to flexibly learn ways into the obviously fast-growing and well-paying world of technology. So it is not too late for anyone if they're still interested. Yes. And especially for parents of girls who might be in high school, one of the biggest challenges is finding a mentor, a female mentor in this field. Because when I would go to class, I would be one of maybe two or three women in a 50 person engineering class. And that doesn't even account for the vast majority of professors. I mean, the the gender gap at a higher level of STEM in the professor world is even worse. Mm -hmm. And so all of my professors were men. And it's, 
you can you can get a good mentor that happens to be a male, but there's just something about having a strong female mentor to help you walk you through all of the challenges that only you will face mm-hmm. in this world that makes it really nice. Um, that's the other thing that is so cool that Olay is doing. They, they've invested a million dollars into providing female mentorship to young girls who want to see themselves in STEM by partnering with um, organizations like Million Women Mentors. And mm-hmm. so for any parents who are interested, Million Women Mentors is another great organization to help your child find that female mentor that could help change their career. Well, that's so cool. I love that. And I, I wish, I know I wish I had access to a mentor and that that's a really fabulous initiative. Um, I'm also curious as a mother, you know, so many of us are trying to parent with intention, maybe parenting differently than the way that we were parented or even as a generation, um, being aware of the gap in STEM, the pay gap, um, all of that. Can you think of any ways that you're trying to raise a daughter where, you know, all the opportunities are available to her and, and ways that you're actually practicing that on, um, really a modeling and a parenting basis. Yeah. I mean, right now, and I'm going to learn as I go and the strategies are going to change as she gets older because right now she's only two and a half. So the strategies that I'm employing right now that I think will have a really useful, Um, outcome when it comes to making STEM feel more accessible to her is when she comes across something that she finds challenging Mm. and she'll say, mommy, help me, mommy, help me. I say, Rose, let's take a deep breath and try one more time. And then if you can't get it on that try, then mommy will help you. And so just the act of like taking a beat and trying something difficult one more time Mm is something that I think is so, so useful because she often gets it on that second try. And I love when this happens because when she does get it, she'll often look at me like with this proud surprise look on her face and say, mommy, I didn't need help. Mommy, I didn't need help. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that actually worked. (laughs) Like I'm just feeling my way through parenting right now. And so when that happens, it feels like such a reward because I think so often in engineering and in STEM, it becomes hard and we're afraid of what would happen if we fail at it. So we just don't want to attempt it at all. And so if I can infuse this, let's take a beat and try one more time. Um, I think that will lead to some very useful life skills down the line. Totally. I mean, and it's obviously it's especially important for women and girls. I mean, so many of us are just raised like we were saying about, earlier, so many of us are raised with this idea of needing to be perfect, perfect grades, look a certain way, look perfect. Um, but I was watching Emily's Wonder Lab and you said something that, that really just like shined for me. You said the basis of all science is trial and error. We are learning what works and what doesn't. And you said it with a smile and it just made me think that taking that attitude to our children's childhood of like, let's explore, let's discover, let's try this together. Let me show you first. And then you do it yourself. Um, it's really not just an attitude you can take to science, but also to like cultivating resilience and, you know, self-confidence in your kids. Yeah. And I think having this positive attitude toward failure as a whole is just really, really important because sometimes learning what doesn't work, learning what you don't like, learning the negative of it all mm. can be even more powerful or even more useful than learning what does work. Can you talk about failure in your own parenting journey, I guess, specifically? Like, can you think of a time where you tried something and were able to recognize like, you know what, this really isn't working and we're going to try something else. And maybe, and maybe that did. Oh my gosh. I mean, <laughs> it's uh, parenting is just, it's, there's no science to it. I think sometimes mm. because what right now we're having a, a hard time with getting our daughter to go to bed. We're having a little bit of a sleep regression situation and we are trying so many different things. And what's hard is that something that doesn't work one week will likely work another, another week. Mm-hmm. And so it's hard to try something and it doesn't work and be like, okay, well, let's put that in the trash pile and try something new because like, it's just a tool in the toolbox 
that you can maybe leverage a little bit later down the line. Mm. Um, so for me, I think just being resilient to failure and not taking it personally um, has been the most important part because mm -hmm. once you start taking it personally, it becomes more of like an emotional, mental issue. Mm. It, it weighs on the parent and we just have to have some grit and bear it and mm -hmm. stay positive. And I think just being very open about um, what you're feeling at the time with your partner is really useful. Mm. Um, but yeah, trial and error is, is tough, I think, as a parent. Uh, yeah, when I when you started talking about that, I that was exactly my thought of it's it's not just trial and error; it's trial and error throughout time. And then you have another kid, and the thing that worked with one kid didn't work. I mean, it's it's definitely actually we, we have four kids, and I I've been thinking about it um, as an ecosystem in our households. And once I realized, like, it's not you know family rules you we have the rules and you follow us and this is how it's supposed to be and shifted to this idea of it's an ecosystem and they're growing and changing and interacting. I was able to go with the flow more um, rather than having strict rules about exactly how I thought it should be when it was never actually running according to that, <laughs> that mental image of what it should be. Yeah. Yeah. We are about a month away from having our second. And so um, we are going to learn very quickly that yes. all children are different. And yeah. we got very lucky with our first because she was such a great sleeper in the beginning. And that made parenting so much easier when mm -hmm. you yourself can actually parent on a good night's rest. Mm. Um, and so we are fully expecting the second child to be a nightmare. <laughs> you know, it, maybe and maybe not. I Sometimes you... Later down the line, something else pops up. I, I, my best friend, her kids were always hard sleepers, and I always felt like I got so lucky with the sleepers. But then we had different problems. So, yeah, it, it's that ecosystem. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I know you've talked in the past about um, just some of the gender discrimination that you've actually faced within your career um, that you were maybe recommended or talking about a show, but they maybe turned you down because. And I certainly want you to tell the story. So they turned you down because they said the viewership was primarily male. Can you talk a bit about really the challenge of being the pioneer in a field that has been led by men and trying to represent women, but the headwinds that you face? Yeah, it's tough because the, the major science networks um, that will not be named, but you can kind of imagine them. Um, they have all of the major hit science shows. And if you look at the hosts of those science shows, they have all of the same gender for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason that is, is because the audience that watches those networks is predominantly, predominantly male. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, the marketing team of these big networks, they look at that and they use that as a justification to continuously buy and green light male written, male driven, male hosted shows. Mm. But then you have this like tough, it's like a cyclical nature, right? right? Because then you, you then attract more male viewers to watch your network. Um, and I think sometimes people in those positions just aren't willing to make a change. They're not mm. willing to take a risk. Um, and in one, one particular meeting that was really frustrating, there was a very cool show that I was going to be the host of that we were pitching to this major science network. And they said, well, we don't think that our predominantly male audience will relate well to a solo female host. So we need to find you a male co-host. Do you have a boyfriend or something who can co-host the show with you? And it was just very frustrating feedback mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, to receive. So I was very surprised when I got the call from Netflix and very excited when they said that not only were they greenlighting Emily's Wonder Lab, but they were totally fine with me filming at nine months pregnant. And so now there is this wildly pregnant woman hosting a science show in 190 countries and 38 different languages on the largest streaming platform in the world. And it just takes one person mm -hmm. to say, let's give this a shot and see if it works. And then you get to t look at the data <laughs> and see if it works. 
And so I just, I think we need more people like that that are willing to take that risk. I'm sure you've gotten a lot of feedback from families, from girls about what it's meant. And please don't be humble right now. I think it's really important. Like, I want to hear what have you heard about seeing a woman like you on TV talking about science, running experiments? What have people told you that it's meant to them? I mean, the show's been out for a year and a half, and there has not been a day that has gone by where I have not received dozens, not just a message, but dozens of messages and comments from families talking about what this meant for their kids. Um, I think for a number of reasons, one, because of the pandemic in general, this just happened to be a like a godsend to families mm-hmm. who are looking for activities to do in their home. Um, Cause at the end of each episode, we do this very cool at home experiment with accessible materials that you probably already have lying around mm-hmm. your house. So that's one of the reasons Two, obviously families with daughters were able to see something that they hadn't really seen much of mm-hmm. before. And so there, there are stories of parents who say like her dad's an engineer And she never was interested in science or engineering before Mm -hmm. she saw you. So not even her own dad (laughs) could get her excited about STEM, but she saw someone who looked like her do this on TV. And now all of a sudden she wants to grow up and be a scientist. Um, The past two Halloweens have had dozens and dozens of girls dress up as me because they wanted to be a scientist for Halloween. Like it's, it's the most meaningful project I've ever worked on. I am so, so incredibly proud of it. These messages are just like, they, they, they drive me to want to create more mm-hmm. things like this. Mm-hmm. As you are well aware, science and math and technology are all around us as parents, but maybe we don't think of them as being all around us. What are some small ways you think that parents can begin incorporating talking about STEM, recognizing STEM in their everyday lives with their kids? Yeah, I think the kids do that for us because they have so many questions about the things that they see, whether it be in the sky or in the home or at school or on the playground or in nature. And oftentimes I think that we as parents have no idea what the answer is um, because it's just sometimes it's an off the wall question. But I think if we can take the extra second to Google the question and just try to find some sort of answer that would make sense, that is a way to help foster that curiosity because you you want your kids to constantly be curious. You want them to look at the things that they see around them. And if anything confuses them or surprises them or delights them, that they ask why it happens because that is such a fun, real, tangible way to learn something new. Mm -hmm. And if you kind of blow off the question with a, I don't, I don't know, I don't know why, then you can stifle their curiosity. And so taking the extra second to be like, Ooh, I don't know. Let's try to find out because I I don't think any child expects their parents necessarily to know all of the answers Mm. or maybe they shouldn't. But if you show them that it's, it's totally fine to be like, you know what? I don't know. Let's dig a little deeper. Let's see if we can find some information online. Um, I think that's a really fun way to encourage that curiosity. Mm. It's okay not to have all the answers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's why we have Google. Yeah. Um, you're, you are a science communicator at a time that is very fraught for science communications. Mm. Um, I know you, for example, I know you grew up in West Virginia and you posted a video on Instagram about climate change mm. and coming at the issue of climate change with a lot of empathy for where you people where you grew up who came from coal mining families built that industry feel really devoted to it um in and bring that family experience and point of view to their own knowledge of climate change um can you talk about why empathy has to be at the core of science communications, especially over controversial topics and, and really what you've learned from your own background. Yeah. So with any interaction, um, that you have with people, especially when you have them online, which is one of the hardest ways to have these interactions, Mm -hmm. you have to ask yourself, is my goal with this interaction to be right? Or is it to change somebody's mind? Is it Mm. to actually be persuasive? Is it to educate? 
Because if the goal is to simply be right, then you don't have to do much effort. Like you can be snarky, you can be condescending, you can make jokes and you, you might be right, but that's all you'll be. Mm. And if you want to actually change somebody's mind, if you want to educate them, if you want to hopefully be persuasive, you kind of have to dig a little deeper and understand where that person is coming from, Mm -hmm. have a little empathy for how they ended up where they did in their thought process of whatever you're talking about, whether it be climate change or vaccines or whatever it is. Um, Because a lot of times these people share a lot of the same values that you do which is they want to keep their family safe. They want to keep a roof over their head. They want a good job. They want a good life for their family. And those values just ended them up in a different place than where it ended you up Mm. in terms of what you believe. Um, And so I think you have to get closer to the root of the issue. So with with West Virginia, for example, um, coal, the dying coal industry hit West Virginia really, really hard. And so there's a lot of families there who don't have jobs, who are dealing with a paycheck to paycheck situation. They're trying to figure out how to put a roof over their head. They're trying to figure out how to put food on the table. And they simply don't have the bandwidth to Mm -hmm. think about something that's so large and long-term like climate change. And on top of that, it feels a little bit like environmental policies, environmentally friendly policies, haven't been very friendly to them. That's sort of been their scapegoat for Mm -hmm. why they've lost all of their jobs and why they have all of these problems. And so it's more of an economic issue there than an an educational one, really. Um, Any other guidance using that empathy framework around vaccines? I mean, for example, Mm -hmm. there's still so many moms who believe in the science but are just worried they just that's what all the evidence shows like there's a lot of hesitancy not rejection of the science and I think empathy can play a big role there in science communications what do you think oh yeah because it's so hard I mean a lot of times we don't know scientists who work on these things and so it doesn't feel very human um just two days ago I had somebody uh message me on Facebook saying I'm pregnant I've had the first two vaccines, but I'm hesitant to get the booster while I'm pregnant. My doctor thinks I should get one right away, but I'm just nervous and I wanted to know what you thought. And that interaction is just so interesting to me because here is someone who has received advice from someone who has expertise in the field and that wasn't enough to quell their fears. And they're going to someone who I like to imagine that they trust, Mm -hmm. like me, for another opinion. And mind you, this is not my area of expertise. I did not get a a, a master's in immunology or a PhD in immunology. This is not my Mm -hmm. area of research. Um, But I told her how I made the decision to get the booster while I was pregnant. And I was telling her all of the things that led me to that decision. And then that was enough for her to feel comfortable with it. And so I think a lot of times these people just want to feel heard. It just feels so inhuman at times because we don't know where the science came from. We don't Mm. know any of the scientists. Our doctors sometimes don't feel like they're someone that we can trust sometimes. And Mm -hmm. so you just, you need someone to hear you. Um, And I think that part of it can be really impactful totally agree and you set up such a great example to have that conversation well thank you for doing that I'm curious too you talked a bit about empathy and science which are not necessarily two things I would think go together Um, and we've talked a bit about perfectionism and failure and how embracing failure can help those of us who struggle with perfectionism if you think about the little girl Emily who (laughs) didn't know what she was going to do with her life, maybe didn't even think she was that smart. What kind of empathetic message would you want to be sending to her standing where you are today? Oh my gosh. I, I would love to show high school Emily or middle school Emily what she is capable of um, because that would have changed my middle school and high school life a little bit, I think. Yeah. Um, for me, I, was a, I think I had a, a rough go um, in high school, I just wasn't very confident in myself. I didn't, I didn't know what I was good at. I tried so many things and I was just mediocre at all of them. Mm. (laughs) And so I think that knowing 
that you can get good at something later in life is can be so powerful that you can make yourself smarter with mm-hmm. time that you that hard work really does pay off that grit is more important than natural ability um those are the things that i, I would like that. to tell my younger self you have a new book tell us about reach for the stars Yeah. So Reach for the Stars is my very first picture book. And I wrote that after my daughter was born. And it infuses a lot of the things that we're talking about, actually, in this podcast, all of the things that I hope that I can teach her throughout life, whether it be about science or the universe, or just about life lessons about failure, and being courageous and what being brave really means. Um, And it follows a child throughout different stages of her life and talks about all the different things that she'll reach for as she gets older. And so, it, I mean, it literally starts from an infant to an adult who leaves home, mm-hmm. um, which is very heartbreaking mm-hmm. for to, to read. If anyone out there is thinking about creating a book where you watch your infant child um, grow up and leave home, I don't <laughs> recommend it because it hurts a lot to read. <laughs> Sounds like um, that book, I'll Love You Forever, um, kind of pulling on those heartstrings, but also, once again, putting a girl front and center to the story. And I know, you know, so many of us as girls didn't get to be the center of these stories. So that representation is just as important. Okay, Emily, at Motherly, we believe that motherhood brings out our superpowers. So I define superpowers as forces within us that are so powerful, so transcendent, and often forces that we didn't even know were there until we became a mother ourselves. So I'm curious, what do you think is your superpower? Oh my gosh. I mean, lately, because I'm dealing with the twos and toddlerhood, I think um, surviving chaos, if that can be a superpower, it is for me because I have always been sort of an anxious person And when things aren't perfectly in line, it would make me really nervous that I didn't have everything together. And now things can be messy. I can have a toddler screaming. I can take a deep breath and find my patience and just work through the chaos to be able to parent um, and get everything done. I think for me, that is the superpower (laughs) that That I've found, surviving chaos. That is a really important one, especially with another baby on the way. (laughs) Well, Emily Calandrelli, thank you so much for joining us on the Motherly Podcast. Thanks so much for having me.